So we need to go ahead and have seats and we'll get started here in just a moment. Good morning. We have a uh, we have an exciting week ahead of us and an exciting day ahead of us. This, uh, today, we have a guest speaker with us, Brother Jack Wilkie. Um, I came to know Jack through social media. Uh, I, never, I never had any kind of personal contact with Jack until I started seeing this guy who's posting all these articles, and I thought, this guy gets it. He's, he, is, he is focused on scripture. He, is, he has a lot of wisdom in the way he presents things. And so we started having some correspondence online and stuff like that. And I've just, um, I've, I've come to consider Jack as a friend and I've, and I've got a lot of respect for Jack. And I think that our congregation is gonna be blessed today with him being here to encourage us. Uh, today we're going to be, as we kick off our vacation Bible school for this week, we're going to be studying the flood. This morning during Bible class, Jack is going to be, uh, he's going to be dealing with the question of the flood, especially from an apologetic standpoint. Uh, did it actually happen the way that the Bible said that it happened? Can we have confidence in what Scripture teaches? Uh, this morning, he's going to present a sermon on the justice of God and, uh, and questions surrounding that. And then this afternoon, he's going to present a lesson on how we can learn from the example of the faith of Noah. And so, um, Brother Jack, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hand the class over to you. on. Am I on? Okay, there we go. Uh, I want to thank you guys for having me. Thank you especially to Tyler uh, for reaching out. And he has very kind words from him, but he is quite uh, the writer himself. I always enjoy his work, and so uh, I'm glad he brought me here that I've been able to be I'm especially excited to talk about the flood. Let's start with a prayer, and then let's get into why we can believe this really did happen. Let's pray. We are humbled to be before you. We are thankful to gather with your saints here in Olive Branch. We're thankful for your church around the world, and we pray your blessings on us as we worship you today, as we study your word. Help us, Father, to have open minds and hearts, uh, to know you better through your word, to believe more strongly, uh, and that it would affect our lives as we go forth from here and uh, live throughout the week. I pray your blessings on me as I speak, that I would say that which is true and that which is a blessing to those who hear and strengthens their faith. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Be turning to Genesis 6, of course, that's going to be uh, our text for this, this entire day, Genesis 6 through 9, the flood of Noah, as it's called. Before we get to some of those evidences up there, have you heard phrases like, the Bible is anti-science? Or, I would believe in Christianity, but I just, I believe in science instead of, of Christianity. I, I, the Bible, you know, that's, it's got some good moral teachings in it, but can you really believe in a talking snake? Can you really believe in this worldwide flood? Can you really believe in the age of the earth being younger than billions and billions of years or any of these things? And so we're constantly told we have to choose between being scientific, being accurate, being almost being intelligent, and being a Christian. And if, you, if you really believed in science, if you really studied a little bit, you'd know that this isn't that accurate. And you know, use your Bible to, to make you a better moral person, sure. But, I mean, come on, it's not a history book. It's not a science book. It, don't, don't really rely on it for that. That's what the culture believes about the Bible. Uh, they don't believe it's fully inspired. They don't believe it's accurate on all of these things. In fact, they believe, especially a lot of the Old Testament, 
is mythology. You'll hear, oh, it was Bronze Age goat herders writing down folk tales, and that's what you have here. That's the, the mythology that we have with people like Noah and Abraham and so forth. There's very much an attack on the inspiration of the Bible, and rarely anymore do people say, well, Jesus didn't, just didn't exist. They know that's a non-starter anymore. They know the evidence is too strong. That, you don't hardly ever hear that anymore. There was a time where that was in the books, that was the claim that was made. Nobody's doing that anymore. If they want to attack the Bible, where do they go? They go to Genesis 1 through Genesis 11. What happens in Genesis 1 through 11? You have the creation. You have Adam and Eve. You have the fall. You have Cain and Abel. You have this downward spiral of mankind that leads to the flood. You have the ark. You have the global flood. You have the restart with Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth and their wives. And then you have the Tower of Babel and the, the dispersion of peoples through the language. And then after that, you come to Abraham, and that's the point at which people go, okay, there's some historic semblance of this. Because of Judaism and Christianity and Islam, they trace back to Abraham. There's something there. We'll give you that. But everything that happened before that was just allegory. It was myth. It was just trying to teach you some stories through mythology. Is that true? Well, let's get at that today, especially with the flood. And, and why this matters, why this section matters, think about what battlegrounds arise in, in, in Genesis 1 through 11. You've got that question of the origin of the earth and the origin of life. Were we created in six days or was there some big bang in a 13 billion year process of the universe developing into what it is? Were, were man and woman placed as Adam and Eve in a garden or was it just kind of this slow development from Neanderthals and cavemen and, and up to what we have today? And, and really, are, is mankind growing better and better and better or actually declining over time because of we started off with perfect human beings that fell or we're just increasingly better and better? These, these are very important ideas that are there. The origin of sin, the origin of death, the origin of marriage. Uh, you think that's under attack? Go walk down the, the aisle of your grocery store, see how much rainbow packaging there is every June, right? This, this pride month that we're surrounded with. That question comes right back to Genesis chapter 2. And so when you attack it and say this is all myth and it's not authoritative, there's not uh, practical teaching in there, it really matters. There's so many other things. The, uh, again, the, the flood itself and what it teaches us about geology and the age of the earth and all of these things. And, and there's this temptation for Christians to compromise, to give a little bit of ground and say, well, okay, I believe in Jesus, I believe in the New Testament, I believe in the resurrection, I believe in, in Christianity and, and baptism and the church and all that, but uh, okay, let's, let's distance ourselves from that a little bit. We don't want to look stupid. We don't want people that we're trying to evangelize to think, well, Oh, those people believe in talking snakes. Well, guess what? If you believe in a talking snake and people can't have a hard time getting their head around that, or if you don't believe in a global flood and that a man built an ark and, and escaped from it with his family because God told him to, and you think, that's just too much, I can't believe that, what are you going to do when it comes time for a man to walk out of the grave after calling his shot on the third day? Which one's harder to believe? That somebody defeated death or that a snake talked? And so when you start compromising, you start giving that ground, a lot of things unravel. I want to read a quote from uh, Andy Stanley, the preacher for what was and, and might still be the biggest church in America over in Atlanta. It's a Baptist-y kind of community as church. And he, he kind of went viral, got in some hot water a few years ago for saying, Christians, we need to unhitch from the Old Testament. There's just a lot of stuff about God in there that unbelievers don't like, and when we try to evangelize, it gets in the way. And so let's just... Kind of, kind of let's almost be ashamed of the Old Testament. Let's just not emphasize that very much. Let's stick to the New Testament. Number one, that means he hasn't read the New Testament very much because there's a lot of parallels that we're going to talk about here in a minute and that we're especially going to talk about in the, the Sunday sermon this morning about judgment, about who God is, about God's character. He didn't change from the old to the new. So that's one problem. But the other is, if you're just saying let's cut off over half of the Bible you're going to miss a lot about God, a lot of truth, a lot of uh, these teachings that are foundational as we talked about. I want to read one quote from him before we get into these evidences. He said, Unhitching the Old Testament from the New is liberating for men and women who are drawn to the simple message that God loves you so much He sent His Son to pave the way to a relationship with you. It's liberating for people who need and understand grace, who need and understand forgiveness. And it's liberating for people who find it virtually impossible to embrace the dynamic the worldview, and the value system depicted in the story of ancient Israel. 
Well, you know, you don't see, when you talk about the flood, the love of God and grace and forgiveness, and it's a little harder to sell, so let's just not talk about the flood. No, let's talk about the flood. We cannot have this idea that puts God, a God that would flood the world against a God that would die for the world. It's the same God. You need to be able to understand both sides of him, and you need to believe that this really happened. Why does it matter? Again, why do we really have to hold on to this? Well, number one, one of the most important reasons why this matters Jesus thought it was real. Jesus thought Noah survived the flood. He references it in Matthew 24. When he's talking about his coming in destruction, he says it's going to be just like in the days of Noah where people were, were having a good time and they weren't ready when it started raining. Why would he reference something that didn't happen? Why would he reference something that was fake? You see, New Testament doctrines, our doctrine of baptism, Peter in 1 Peter 3, 20 and 21, grounds it in Noah and his family, eight people being saved by an ark through the water. It says, corresponding to that, baptism now saves you. Peter thought it was real. Jesus thought it was real. Whoever wrote Hebrews thought it was real. In Hebrews chapter 11, when he's recording the acts of faith in the Old Testament and the heroes of the faith, he points to Noah. Why would you point to a mythological figure who didn't exist to make a point about the importance of faith and acting on it? All of the people in the New Testament believe it existed, and if they believe that Noah existed, they believe the flood happened, and they were wrong... What does that tell us about the New Testament? It's very flawed. You, are we sure if, we, if, if they're wrong about that, what else are they wrong about? What other details did they miss? There's a lot writing on whether or not the flood actually happened. Whether or not Noah was a historical figure. Whether or not Babel happened and the, the dispersion of language. Whether or not Adam and Eve existed. All of these things that happened in Genesis 1 through 11. All of those things that it gives us. I mentioned marriage and humanity and our purpose on earth and, and sin and, and the fall and all of these things, the rainbow, again, once, uh, once again, as I mentioned, it's being co-opted and corrupted right now, but the rainbow comes from Genesis 9. This all starts here. We have to interpret the world we see through Genesis 1 through 11. So if it did happen, let's kind of do the scientific method a little bit, hypothesize. There was a global flood that destroyed all life except for eight people on an ark and the animals that God sent to them, two by two and seven by seven of the clean, that this really did happen. And if that happened, what would you expect to see? Well, as you see on, on slide number one, you'd expect to see global evidence of a mass casualty event. Look in Genesis uh, chapter 6, verse 13. Then God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence because of them, and behold, I am about to destroy them with the earth. Make for yourself an ark of gopher wood, for you shall make the ark with rooms, and shall cover it inside and out with pitch. He goes on to give the details, but let's go to verse 17. Behold, I, even I, am bringing the flood of water upon the earth to destroy all flesh in which is the breath of life from under heaven. Everything that is on earth will perish. It's a big threat. That's, you, you think about just life all over the world. If everything is going to die, if everything is going to be wiped out, and it's going to happen in this catastrophic event in rain in 40 days, 40 nights, the fountains of the deep burst forth, all of these details it gives us of, of just a, a total washout. Have you ever seen a flash flood where water comes up really fast and, and people can be dragged under, you know, in, into drainage ditches? And, and it's a very dangerous thing, but it can also do a lot of damage. It can erode a lot of things. It can make a big difference in a very short amount of time. Now imagine that happening everywhere for 40 straight days. There's going to be a lot of damage, there's going to be a lot of death, a lot of destruction going on. So did it happen? Well, what do we see when we look around? You see what are called fossil graveyards all over the world. This is from isgenesishistory.com. This is one in Canada. All kinds of uh, fossils that you see, and if you'll pay close attention, a couple of those kind of look like fish in the middle of Canada. Interesting. We'll get to that in, in a little bit more, but, but tuck that away. An interesting thought. But you see these fossil graveyards in Canada, and they, they share more pictures of, in Italy, fossil graveyards. When we say graveyards, we don't mean they found a dinosaur somewhere. We mean places where they start digging, and here's a dead animal, here's a dinosaur, here's a fish, here's a bird, here's a everything. And they've got them on Australia, they've found them in Brazil, they've found them in Italy, they've found them in Russia, they've found them in America, they've found them all over the world. Well, why would that happen? How would that happen? Of course, the, the explanation from those that don't want to believe in Noah's flood is it was a bunch of local floods happening over time. 
That, that's just, it's happened over and over and over and over all over the world. Uh, maybe, but you look at uh, all of these, um, this one in Brazil, another one. I want to read these details from it. My eyesight is not good enough to read it back there, so I'm going to turn around for a second, break a cardinal rule of speaking, but that's okay. It is abundantly clear from examination of the incredible preservation of so many fossils in the Santana Formation that this fossil graveyard represents a spectacular cata uh, catastrophic event given that flying reptiles and terrestrial dinosaurs, plants, insects, and spiders are found buried together and exquisitely preserved as fossils with fish of many types, crocodiles, turtles, and various marine invertebrates. Obviously, to produce this fossil graveyard required a catastrophic mass mortality event to virtually instantaneously kill and bury all these organisms together. Notice that instantaneously. Notice that all kinds of different life. One of the things we're going to talk about in a minute is this idea of the geologic column, that dinosaurs and these other animals didn't exist together, that it was a, a gradual evolutionary process, that over billions of years, this kind of animal lived, and then it died, and this kind of animal lived, and, and they went extinct, and then the next one, and the next one. These are all right next to each other. Animals of every stripe, all over the world. This, this one in Brazil, we just looked at Italy, Canada. Everywhere we look, we find... Billions, as, as one person put it, billions of dead things lay, buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth. The other thing about these is, as he noted, there is a, a very much a preservation there that could only happen if this happened very, very rapidly. If, if something died, and, and let's say an animal drops dead, a deer drops dead in the forest today, and it just lays there and it's picked over by the vultures, by wolves, by whatever, and it's, it decomposes, there's not going to be a whole lot there. There's, you know, there, you're going to find skeleton, you're going to find bones hundreds of years later. That's about it. With so many of these, what they're finding more and more is, especially with the dinosaurs that they've, they've started finding more in the last 10 years, is when they break open the bones, soft tissue is in there. Blood cells are in there, preserved perfectly. That doesn't happen if it laid out there in the sun for 20,000 years while it slowly had sediment burying it. That happens really, really quickly. That means in a few days, maybe 40 days and 40 nights, water came down, killed these, buried these, laid down sediment over them, and froze them in place, perfectly preserved. And we have this all over the earth. What does that indicate to you? To me, that indicates something really big happened to kill all, all kinds of animals at the same time, and it's happened all over the world. Going on from there, this idea of a global evidence of a mass casualty event, uh, but also second, I guess my slide got deleted. Uh, the second is that there would be evidence that water had covered every inch of the earth. Water has covered every inch of the earth. When you look at things like the Grand Canyon, when you look at the, the topography of the world, when you look at the, the sediment of the world, you have this thing that's called the geologic column. And you can see when you look at places like the Grand Canyon, those layers, the, the, the dirt is different colors. The explanation of that from people who deny the flood and say this was all over billions of years is that it just slowly was carved out by water, slowly sediment was laid down, slowly and, and earth has just kind of gotten a little bit of a thicker crust ever since of more sediment, more dust, more dirt. And, and each layer, as you see in this slide, represents an era. And in those eras, certain animals existed. There was, as you see, it goes kind of from very basic animals, leads up to dinosaurs, but then dinosaurs start disappearing. And then you get to the top layers, are us, humans, you know, the, the animals, more recent animals, that's what should be buried at the top. And if their hypothesis is correct, that this all happened very gradually over billions of years, that's exactly what you would expect to see. It's very simple organism, you know, very uh, uncomplex, I guess, life would be at the bottom, and life would grow in complexity toward the top, and then you'd see more recent life, biological life, buried in the top layers. And that things like the Grand Canyon would show that, that sedimentary evidence, and that's what those layers are all about. Except something called Mount St. Helens happened. I'm not going to ask uh, people to raise hands to, if you remember it, because that would... Uh, give away your birth date at least to a degree of, of how long you've been around, and uh, I know people don't want to give away their age. Mount St. Helens happened in 1980. It was a volcano in Washington. Exploded, massive explosion. Ash went over mo much of the United States. Um, it was felt, the, the quake from it, for hundreds of miles. Very big deal. One of the other things that Mount St. Helens did was blow a hole 
in this geologic column idea. It blew a hole in this idea of, of layers being laid down rapidly, or I mean, slowly, over all those years. Because when it happened, certain things happened. You look at those layers that we talk about. Look at how quickly those were laid down. Look how much got laid down in one month following the explosion of Mount St. Helens, the eruption from May 18th to June 20th. And then uh, gradually over the next couple of years, how much was added. It shows that these layers can be added very quickly if there is a catastrophic event. If something happens really fast, it makes that happen. And this was one where as the lava, uh, lava magma, I'm not very scientific, I don't always get that right, which one is which, I think it's lava, flowed down the, the side of the mountain and carved these things out, but also water that was sent from Spirit Lake there. And, and all of these things combining this gigantic event just totally changed the topography of the entire area, laid down all kinds of sediment, uh, showed us fossils being uh, happening rapidly, showed us that all of this can happen really quickly if something really big happens. When you look at what happened here in Genesis, God's saying that the fountains of the great deep burst forth and uh, the, the, the windows of the heavens were opened, essentially, that all this water dumped down, it was an event that big all over the world. Guess what happened? You've got evidence of things like this happening all over the world. You look at these as a very important point that helps us establish the flood and, and debunk the geologic column teaching that I just went over of the idea that it was all over billions of years, that each, each layer represents tens or hundreds of millions of years. You have these things called polystrate fossils. And that is a fossil that extends through multiple layers of sediment, multiple layers of that column. There's only two ways that can happen. Number one is if, if you want to believe the geologic column, it would be that some of those trees or some of those animals lived and were slowly preserved over the course of 500 million years. That's not scientifically possible. Or they were preserved instantaneously while those things rapidly were laid down. We have polystrate fossils all over the world, trees that extend through what should be hundreds of millions of years of sediment from that theory that didn't happen. How did something like that happen all over the world? We know people just don't want to buy it. There's, again, not just plants, not just trees like this, but animals that were in multiple layers all over the world. Beyond that, as we look at evidence that water covered every inch of the earth, Appalachian Mountains, and we're going to look at a few of these, Appalachian, Appalachian. I just moved here. Somebody set me straight on that. Either way, I want to say it. All right, I'm, I'm going to go with Appalachian, and if, if that's wrong, don't throw anything at me. Um, 6,000 feet above sea level, what do you see in there? You see seashells. We have evidence of this all over the world, even all over the earth, even in the Himalayas. Some will say on Everest itself, we have evidence of these things. This is one in Iraq of over 10,000 feet in elevation. Sea life. How would ocean life get up that high? This is a funny one. Scientists say ocean fossils found in mountains are cause for concern over future sea levels. Essentially, the earth was once so warm, we didn't have the polar ice caps, the water came that high, things died up there, and then receded, and it's going to go that high again. Yeah, not, not terribly likely. Uh, again, if, if we believe Genesis where God says, I'm never going to flood the earth again, then we know that's not going to happen. So you've got that, but the other thing is, is this really the explanation for how it got up there, that the water really did cover everything, was all over all the land? Sure doesn't seem like it. You go on from that, some of the explanations they give, this one is, is very funny to me. They found microscopic marine life high up on a mountain. They said one group of scientists argued that the diatoms accumulated in a marine basin after ice sheet retreat, and later, after it got much colder, were moved by the growing glaciers to the mountains. So it, they were down in the water, that water froze over, and then the, the glacier grew, and apparently it slid up a mountain, defying gravity, and settled there, and that's why we have marine life fossilized on top of a mountain. Why is this easier for them to believe than that Noah was in an ark and the waters rose over the mountains? In fact, if you look at it, while we're here in Genesis 7, verses 17 through 22. Then the flood came upon the earth for forty days, and the water increased and lifted up the ark, so that it rose above the earth. The water prevailed and increased greatly upon the earth, and the ark floated on the surface of the water. The water prevailed more and more upon the earth, so that all the high mountains everywhere under the heavens were covered. The water prevailed fifteen cubits higher, and the mountains were covered. All flesh that moved on the earth perished, birds and cattle and beasts and every swarming thing that swarms upon the earth and all mankind, of all that was on the dry land, 
all in whose nostrils was the breath of the spirit of life, died. What did that tell us? It says water covered the whole earth. It says it was over the, all, any elevation you went. Why is that necessary for this global flood? Because it was going to kill everything. But if there were mountaintops that were not covered, what would you do? You just go up there and camp out for a little while. Ride out the storm. Yeah, it would be pretty tough. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's, your, your food would be pretty scarce and it would be a challenge, but people could just camp out and wait for it to blow over and be done. God says, I'm getting rid of everything. That means the water rose up over the tops of all the mountains. And so we have this. But you notice with these, these claims, the, the climate change one, or this one about the glacier sliding up the mountain or whatever, they're not disputing that marine fossils are up there. They cannot dispute this. They look at it and they say, yeah, there, there are fish on the mountains. There are fish fossils in the Himalayas. We don't know what to do about that, so let's come up with these explanations. Look at this one from, I think it was Newsweek. There was a, a TikTok star, or I, I'm not on TikTok, but somebody did a video where they were up on some mountain and found this humongous fish fossil. Or it was kind of a, an octopus-like creature, tentacles or whatever, fossilized. And they're saying, man, look at this. And a lot of people in the comments and it, we're, we're sharing it saying, Wow, it's almost as if there was a worldwide flood. And of course, the experts have to come rushing in to say, no, 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 it wasn't that. Look at this Newsweek article. Number one, this, this teaches you how to read some of these things from the media, especially when they engage with the Bible. Instead, however, there is a factual reason for this. Notice what they just did. No, 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 the Noah's not factual. We're, we're going to tell you what's factual and what's not. Rather than examining the evidence and say, well, is it or isn't it, they, they say, no, it's not, and we'll tell you why. There's a factual reason for this, as explained in Newsweek by paleontologists. When we find these fossils, it tells us these rocks were laid down in marine conditions, i.e. under the sea. The reason they're now up on a mountain is due to plate tectonic processes like mountain building. When the continents collide together, it results in large-scale tectonic forces that uplift the land, pushing rocks upward to create mountains. That's their explanation, is that, again, everything, all of this was ocean life before, and everything happened, uh, these, these ended up on tops of mountains, because mountains being pushed up by tectonic plates. That's, that's how they all got up there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Who was that doctor who wrote that? Dr. Katie Strang. Isn't that strange? <laughs> Isn't that strange? <laughs> there you go. A very strange explanation indeed. Um, that every single time, the fact that these are on mountains all over the world, that's their explanation, is that all of those mountains once were seabeds. Even inland mountains, even mountains that are hundreds of miles, the Himalayas, once again, about four or five hundred miles from uh, the Indian Ocean, that that was once the bottom of a sea, that essentially the whole world was covered with water. It doesn't work that way. There's a way easier explanation. And you look at the mental gymnastics of this. Well, a glacier slid up the mountain. Well, um, you know, it was at the bottom of the sea and then it pushed up. It, it was, this could have happened, that could have happened, all of these different things could happen. Or there was actually water up there. Why can't they just say that? Well, we know why they can't say that, because if they admit that God got this right, that Genesis is accurate, that it's historically and scientifically accurate, they've got some things to wrestle with. They've got some questions, some bigger questions that come from that. Some things that, that are packed in with Noah's flood that they really, really don't want to acknowledge, and so they will jump through all of these hoops to say it didn't happen. It just wasn't real. It was tectonic, plate tectonics. It was glaciers. It was whatever you want to call it. Again, they say we have blind faith. They mock us for saying we're anti, or they say we're anti-science. They say we're all of these things, and yet they do this. So, as we've seen, there would be evidence of a mass casualty event all over the world. What do we have? Evidence of a mass casualty event all over the world. We, we would have evidence that water had covered the entire earth, the entire planet. But then number three, evidence that all people groups had been affected by it. Because when you look at it, as we just read, God says, all life that has breath. I'm getting rid of everybody. And as the Bible records here in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, it was eight people. That's it. Noah, Noah's wife, Shem, Ham, Japheth, and their wives. That's it. They're not even, they didn't even have kids to bring along yet. It was eight people on this boat. And if the entire world was reduced to eight people, that would have implications, wouldn't it? Uh, for genetics, for as we see later on with Babel, with language and the, the, the splitting of people and the, the, the people groups that we have, the um, you know, Asian and, and European and African and, and the, the way things went different ways from there, that would have an effect on the world we see. But the other thing is, if in your lineage, your great-great-great-grandparents had undergone something like this, where they survived 
in a boat for a year while everybody else was killed, they'd talk about it. It would be in your family lore. It would be something that you would hang on to and pass down through the ages. And that's exactly, again, what we see. This is a tablet of the Epic of Gilgamesh from the, the British Museum in London. The Epic of Gilgamesh is an ancient story about a guy riding out a flood with his family in a boat. And we're going to look at some of the comparisons here in a minute. But there are a lot of these. There's one that maybe even predates the Epic of Gilgamesh uh, called the Epic of Atrahasis, which is uh, an old Babylonian. The Hittites have stories. The Sumerians have stories. Every continent, people groups have a flood story, have an ancestor who survived the flood story. Interesting how that happens. This is a comparison of Epic of Gilgamesh and Genesis, and there's a lot going on there. We're not going to go through some of these, or all of these, because I think a couple of them are uh, a little bit of a stretch, but uh, you have you know, a righteous man, uh, uh, an angry god with the wickedness of the world, a uh, man told to build a boat, a man uh, told that, that this water uh, flood was coming on the earth. Um, just all of these details of uh, the covering the boat in pitch, building a window into the boat, and building a door into the boat, and, and things like this, there's a lot of similarities. And so what do you think people are going to do with that? They're going to say, well, look, Noah's flood, that was just you know, the, the Jewish people, the Hebrew people, copying other people's stories and making it their own. Or you know, it was just mythology that was out there, and the, this is the Bible's version of the mythology that's out there. Or... Since every people group on the planet has this story, maybe it really happened and the Bible was recording the same thing that happened. Yeah, you're going to have details that are uh, different. When you ever played the game Telephone, where one person says something and whispers it to another person, another and another, and it's passed all the way down the line. And you're also going to get, I mean, when we're talking about the entire world being wiped out, it's going to get a little sensationalized. It's a pretty big deal. It's one of those things that can slowly, gradually morph into like a superhero kind of story, a little bit more comic booky, And that's what the Epic of Gilgamesh is, because it has the Noah story in it, but it also goes on to a, a lot of other things. And so it, it starts there and expands it out a lot more. But there's that similarity. And so you have two choices to that, to say, well, the Bible just ripped off myths that were going around, or this really happened, and these are two different recordings of it. One of them... A lot shorter, a lot more concise, a lot more, you know, uh, drilled into the details of the boat and the man, and, and so that's probably the one that's more accurate. That's the one that matches up what we see all over the world. A couple of evidences from China. When the first missionaries arrived, they already knew about the creation and the flood. They claimed not to be Chinese descent, but from somebody named Jafu. This is the, the Chinese symbol for boat. Uh, you know, they, that's their language, is they draw in symbols, and a lot of words are combinations of symbols. And this is one of those that it seems like too good to be true, too evidentiary to be true. You look it up, this is how it is. It's a vessel of eight people is the, the symbols they combine to make up boat. I was reading a story of somebody asking his, his Chinese friend to write boat and ask him what the different symbols were, and he said, yeah, we don't really know why, why the number eight is in there. Like, we, that's just always been in our language. That's how linguistically it goes back, that there's an eight in this symbol. We're not sure why. And he said, well, I can tell you why. It's right here. A vessel of eight people is where they got their word boat. Well, how would that happen unless they had some tie to it, unless they knew something about it all the way back? People all over the world. Because, again, if everybody descended from these same people, then everybody has stake in Noah's Flood. You and I do. We know this story from the Bible's lens, but everybody else knows about it too. Everybody all around the world can point back to this. But then the objections start getting raised. Well, what about that many animals? What about uh, you know, storing all of those? Thankfully, uh, Ken Ham and the folks at Answers in Genesis, have, uh, you know, they undertook a few years ago to build a Noah's Ark full-size replica up there in Kentucky. I have not had the privilege of going to it. Has anyone able uh, to do that? A few of you have. Uh, all I can tell from the pictures is it is incredibly impressive, incredibly gigantic. You see pictures of a, a person standing next to it. It's massive. Mm -hmm. We didn't get a chance to mark it, but we didn't measure it out before we even get it. So y'all go out the front, mm -hmm. and you look from the church sign all the way back to probably about 10 feet past that little car dealership over there. That's about the length of the heart. Wow. There you go. That, there's, there's a visual for you. You can go out and, and take a look at that of just how big this is. Because one of the other things that, that's funny about Noah, and we're going to talk about this in the sermon, the, the children's books, the children's toys, 
uh, the little songs we sing, the paintings on nursery walls of you know this, this little curved boat with a window at the top and Noah and giraffes and lions sticking their heads out the window. And, and so people have that in their head and they think, how could that fit all the animals? And then you see this gigantic thing that looks more like a shoebox, actually, in, in, in shape, but it also looks a lot like our battleships. It looks a lot like what uh, the U.S. Navy builds because those dimensions are the perfect... Uh, unsinkable d dimensions for a boat as, as we have found out as we've researched and uh, over the years come to understand that what God gave Noah was the perfect thing for that boat not to capsize in this great catastrophe. Amazing that he, you know, this Bronze Age person knew this all the way back then that his dimensions were exactly right, but also it was gigantic. It was uh, an incredible size and so when you look at how could he fit all of these animals, number one, the species variation we have was not what they have. I mean, you think about uh, if we surveyed across this room, how many people in here are dog owners? There's probably a lot. How many different kinds of dogs do you have here? Somebody might have a Dalmatian or a Labrador or a, a Beagle or a Poodle or a Chihuahua or whatever it is. Noah didn't have to take all those on the ark. There might have been one or two variations of dog that got on the ark and, and because of breeding and, and the way it's worked ever since, now you have this incredible Variants. And that happens for a lot of animals. We can see the way horses have changed into what they are today. Uh, just over the years through breeding and, and experimentation, what, what breeders have done to bring us the horses we have. They didn't have to worry about that. There was a lot more simplistic, basic animals that they could take, and so you didn't have to have two Chihuahuas, two Dalmatians, two Labradors, two whatever else. So that narrows it down, number one. But number two, the size was massive. You look at when there's been estimates done of the square footage, cubic footage, I guess, of the ark versus the, the uh, visual that you could have 522 boxcars. You ever sit there when a train passes by and, and count how many cars are on there? Uh, I do that with my daughter sometimes just to pass the time. And there was one we got stuck by one time. That was like, I think it was like 120 cars, and it took 20 minutes. It was going really slow through downtown of the, the town we lived in. That was a lot of boxcars. That was a lot of space. Now over four times that many, all of them stacked up, you know, filled with animals, that could hold a lot of animals. That could get a lot done. And you think about, uh, you know, there, there are some really big animals. You think, oh, well, elephants and giraffes and all that. Okay, sure. But think about how many little things there were. Think about how many lizards there were. Think about how many chickens. Think about, you know, things like that, small animals. Not everything took up gigantic amounts. You can fit a lot of tiny little, you look at, you know, if anybody here raises chickens, you can put a lot of chickens in a very small uh, space. You can do that with lots of animals. You don't need that much space. And so they say, yeah, and you can never get all those animals on the ark. Yes, you could if you do the math and just look at it as it is. Number two, they say, well, did they have the skill to do it? These were ancient people. How would they come up with, you know, a, a boat that perfect and, and build it so that it was, well, number one, it was divinely ordained, you know, it, was, it was divinely commissioned. God gave them exactly how to do it, the wood to use, the, the coating to put on it, told them exactly what to do, so you would expect that to work. But number two, we're so silly about this. And I'm really glad that this is kind of becoming into the mainstream of, man, we think we're so smart, but there's really a lot more. In fact, there was a, a Netflix uh, special that was put out. I didn't see it. I don't have Netflix, but I, I, I read about this guy named Graham Hancock who's been banging this drum for years now of, these people were super advanced. They did stuff we don't know how to do all these years later. Yeah, we might have an iPhone. We might send people to space. We might do some of these incredible things. We have no idea how the pyramids got put together. We have no idea how the Sphinx got built. We have no idea how they, they moved these things, Stonehenge or whatever else, these gigantic stones. They didn't have crane. Or we don't, maybe they did. I don't know. They were able to do stuff that we just can't. Building a boat's not that hard. And so that, that, that objection that comes up, they didn't have the skill to do it. Yeah, they did, actually. One of the other objections is, okay, I'll give you that there was a flood, but there was a local flood. Number one, what did we just read in Genesis chapter 7, verse 19? The water prevailed more and more upon the earth, so that all the high mountains everywhere under the heavens were covered. Noah had 120 years uh, warning to build this boat and get ready for it. And the animals were brought to him. All, all that took place. If he had 120 years, you know what he could do? Move pick up his family, walk across the desert, walk up on a mountain, walk up to Europe, you know, go vacation in Italy for a while, let that local flood ride out. It wasn't a local flood. I mean, that, that, that's pointless. And again, as we just saw, evidence, uh, the, the evidence points to things died all over the world. Things like the Grand Canyon were carved out all over the world um, with, with those gigantic, uh, catastrophic rains and, and everything else that was thrown at the world. 
it wasn't just a local flood. God said it was a global flood. There's no reason to think it was a local flood. And when he talks about in the New Testament that he's going to destroy the earth by fire again, that's not going to be a local thing either. God draws that parallel for a reason because he destroyed all life on earth except what was in the ark. All life that has breath, I should say. I think the fish did okay. Um, so as, as we get to these questions and as we get through all of these things, these, these whatabouts and, and these challenges that come at us, as I said at the start, why it matters is because you can be tempted to compromise on Genesis 1 through 11. You can be tempted to say, okay, Jesus was real, the apostles were real, even David and, and Solomon and Daniel, they were real, Abraham was real, Adam and Eve and Noah, okay, th those are just myths to teach us some things, maybe to establish some ideas in the Bible, and, and some good stories to learn from, but that's it. I'm going to give you that, because, man, if I say that there was really a flood, or that the earth isn't that old, or that, that we came from Adam and Eve, or insert whatever Genesis 1 through 11 uh, account that we have, if I say I believe that, they're going to say I'm stupid. They're going to say I'm anti-science. They're going to say, and in fact, you know, the, the Andy Stanley quote I read earlier comes from this idea of if you try to evangelize somebody, they're going to say, look, I could become a Christian except I don't want to buy that Adam and Eve were the first humans. I don't want to believe that there was a global flood. I don't want to give that up because you know, I, don't, I don't want to be stupid. I don't want to make myself anti-science. I'm not going to sign up for any of that, and so that's a hindrance to the gospel. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1 as we finish. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. This does not talk about the flood, but it talks to this attitude. And I think this is an attitude we as Christians really need to think about when it comes to these conversations. When it comes to this challenge of, I don't want to look stupid, I don't want to be anti-science, I don't want them thinking that I'm just some rube who will buy anything that's sold to me. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 22, For indeed, Jews ask for signs, and Greeks search for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified to Jews a stumbling block and to Gentiles foolishness. But to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. He says, Jews ask for signs, Greeks search for wisdom. Americans ask for science. And so we have this tendency to go, well, let me show you all the science that, and, and everything that we just did today. I, I really believe that apologetics are a shield. They're not a sword. And let me explain what I mean by that. We teach these things. We get up and, and examine these things, the evidence for the global flood, not to make somebody believe. Because there's nobody out there who's going to see that and go, wow, the flood really did happen. I'll become a Christian. Why? They're not a Christian because of a heart problem, not a head problem. We speak so many times of the head. But now that you are a Christian and your heart is given to Christ, we can, we can work on the head. We can give you the knowledge to say, this really did happen. I'll give you this. And so when somebody challenges your faith and questions you and says the Bible isn't real, you've got the defense that you can make. You can stand up and say, this really did happen. But it's not the, the science. It's not the experiments. It's not the proof. It's not the polystrate fossils. It's not... Uh, the, the, the fossil graveyards all over the world. It's not the flood narratives and myths and stories in every culture. That's not going to convert anybody. What it does do is for you and for me, gives us confidence that, man, what we have is inspired and accurate and we can believe it. Even if they don't want to, even if they think we're stupid, don't worry about it. Worry about what God says. Worry about standing up with Him. And, and that's exactly what Paul is telling them is, look, your Jewish friends are going to think that you're just completely confused. And that's what they told Paul. Your great learning has driven you mad. Paul, you, you've lost your mind, man. Why are you believing this? He says, your Jewish friends are going to think that. Your Gentile friends that, that, that are deep into philosophy and all the Greek stuff that they had and then the Roman stuff, they're going to think you're an idiot. He says, we don't care. We preach Christ and Him crucified. That message is going to get through to people. That message is going to be what connects to people. And when their heart is in the right place, then their heart is in a place to receive this knowledge that says, and it really did happen. What you don't want to do is to be the person who compromises and unhitches from the Old Testament and say, I'm kind of ashamed of Noah and Adam and Eve and, and God's judgment and the flood and, and, and all that anti-science stuff in the Bible. And so, yeah, no, I'm not one of those Christians who believes that weird stuff. You're giving in to the culture. You're one of those Christians who believes Jesus walked out of the grave, so you believe some weird stuff. You're one of those Christians who believes marriage is between man and a woman, so you believe some weird stuff. You're one of those Christians who believes all kinds of things the world doesn't like, and so maybe just stick with God's Word because the evidence is there anyway. And so as we look at the flood, it really did happen. You can believe that, and because it did happen, 
we can take some very important lessons from that, which we'll get to in the sermon. Thanks for your attention, and we'll uh, pick up here in just a minute. Thank you. Hi, Mike Hickson here. Thank you for spending the last hour with us. We hope that our service, the time that we've spent together, has been profitable to you. We'd love to have you come and be with us in person. Please come every Sunday morning at 9 a.m. for Bible study, 10 a.m. for worship. We meet again on Sunday afternoon at 1 p.m. And then Tuesday morning, we have a very special class. We meet at 10 a.m. And then Wednesday night, midweek Bible study at 7 p.m. Please come and be with us. Hope to see you soon. God bless. Hi, Mike Hickson here. Thank you for spending the last hour with us. We hope that our service, the time that we've spent together, has been profitable to you. We'd love to have you come and be with us in person. Please come every Sunday morning at 9 a.m. for Bible study, 10 a.m. for worship. We meet again on Sunday afternoon at 1 p.m. And then Tuesday morning, we have a very special class. We meet at 10 a.m. And then Wednesday night, midweek Bible study at 7 p.m. Please come and be with us. 